Okay, cool. It's probably a um, yeah, as it's a sort of couple of minutes past two, and we obviously want to uh, uh, sort of keep to keep to sort of time today. Um, yeah, it's probably a good good chance to or good time to get started. So, um, yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for joining uh, today's session. Um, the webinar is going to be focusing on making the most of flip learning with uh, VBOX, and it's predominantly going to be presented by um, yeah, Dr. David Reed from the University of Southampton, who's uh, joining us uh, on this webinar um, today. Um, as I mentioned, we are going to be using uh, we are going to be using VBOX throughout the uh, throughout the session for uh, for Q and A. So. You can you can access the VBOX session by going to uh, opening up a browser and going to vbox.app, or you can go to uh, the App Store and download the VBOX app from there. So yeah, really quickly to just to kind of introduce myself. Um, my name is Joe Probert. I'm the uh, customer success manager for education here at um, at VBOX. Um, and I'm also joined by uh, Dr. David Reed, um, who, as I mentioned, is a um, professor of chemistry at the University of Southampton. Um, I started speaking to David um, probably at the very beginning of this um, this last academic year when um, I, no I noticed that David has sort of been tweeting about some uh, some use that he'd been um, putting VBOX to. And uh, yeah, I got in touch to kind of find out a little bit more about it, and we got um, we got sort of talking there. And as uh, as we sort of had further conversations, um, it became sort of apparent that you know that you know David was using VBOX in you know some really interesting uh, interesting ways. And when I I saw online a, a talk that he delivered um, at uh, at UWE earlier earlier in the year, and um, I asked him if he'd be willing to share that with our, our kind of user group that we um that we have here at vbox and he was thankfully uh very pleased to do so so that's what we've uh, yeah that's what we've got in store uh today the the main kind of objectives that we want to uh yeah that we want to sort of go through and to uh and to sort of cover is um david's going to sort of cover the uh the role of flip learning in the um in the context of teaching chemistry um, he's also going to look at uh, how to utilise voting technology for flip learning um, and how to improve the, uh, the student-teacher dialogue. And he's also going to look at um, some examples um, demonstrating the importance of that in, um, in sort of face-to-face -face lectures. So, yeah, without um, yeah, without sort of any further ado, I'm going to um, I'm going to sort of hand over to David, who's going to um, yeah, sort of share share his. Um, yeah, share his thoughts. So if you just bear with me, I'm just going to make David the presenter. Okay, and you, you, I need to click show my screen. So, um, so uh, here we are. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, making the most of flipped learning with Vox. Actually, I could have flipped that title around and said making the most of VVOX using flip learning. Um, you know, it, it, you can interpret it either way. I'll start off by uh, talking a little bit about what we're here for, what our role is as educators and where this sort of fits into that. Um, and I'll focus particularly on lectures uh, and the problems with lectures and how we can try to overcome those problems, uh, taking advantage of tools like VVOX. And then uh, we'll sort of think about how we can free up the time to use those solutions, because that's often the, the query I get from people. Um, and just before I go on, I should say my background. I, I was a school teacher previously. I've been at the university for 12 years now. Uh, my initial role was to support academics in uh, enhancing their teaching, primarily to support students in the transition to university. And that's something which has kind of stayed with me. So what, I'm, what I'll be talking about here really builds on what I've been doing for the last 12 years. Um, and I should also say I'm, I'm a teaching focused academic, so it is my job to do this kind of stuff, but, but it's also my job to share it with others and, and try and get them doing the same kinds of things. So uh, let's remember why we're here. And I don't know if any of you have seen this fantastic book by Phil Race, The Lecturer's Toolkit. Um, one of the things that he says in there is that our job as lecturers is to do everything we can to make learning happen. Um, now, I think most of my colleagues are on board with that, although there probably is a bit of debate about quite how far we should go to make that learning happen. Where's, where does the student responsibility come in? Uh, we could spend all day talking about that. But there are things we can do to facilitate it and to make it easier for our students. 
Now, one of the things that Phil talks about at great length is this sort of model of learning that he's put together uh, on the basis of thousands of conversations with academics over a period of decades. And what's nice about that is that he's actually basing this on real experience and putting it in language that, that we can understand. It's not buried in pedagogical terminology, as quite a lot of this stuff can be. Um, so that this is something which makes sense to me, and I think actually makes sense to all my colleagues too. So we'll talk a bit more about that later. Anyway, let's think about some of those challenges that we have um, as academics. Um, in order for our students to leave with a degree that's worthwhile, we need to give them a worthwhile learning experience. We need to give them the opportunities to develop the skills that they're going to use in their future employment. Um, we know they're paying a lot of money now, and obviously that has raised expectation levels somewhat. Uh, but if we deliver on those expectations, that will also uh, give us the, the metrics that we need, the things our universities are asking us to do, good NSS scores, TEF we're all familiar with, and obviously league tables. So uh, it's worth putting that effort in and delivering on those expectations. But it's expensive um, in terms not just money, but also in terms of our time. Um, and of course, we don't have much time. As academics, we're very busy with all kinds of other jobs. And, and it's actually quite difficult to find the time to, to do this kind of effective teaching, I guess. So what can we do? How do we do this efficiently? Let's look across our campuses and, and look at our teaching. And I think uh, all too often, this is what we see. We see a, a big lecture theatre. We get a couple of hundred students into a room. Uh, you've got one academic there teaching from the front. And I'm not saying that that's ineffective, but uh, what we'll talk about a little bit in the coming slides is whether that's the best way of doing it. Uh, and then beyond that, we'll think about, well, how can we make the best of the situation that we're in? So. This was an image that I first saw probably about 10 years ago now uh, when someone else was talking to me about the problems with lectures. So you may well have seen this before. I always like to, to just revisit it. Whoops, I've got a problem with my mouse. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna use the mouse pointer, so you're gonna have to just sort of follow what I'm saying because that's obviously messing up my uh, slides. So you look at the front row there, just like our lecture theatres, we've got the very keen students sat at the front, listening intently, writing down every word. And as you go back through the rows, you can see that the, the level of attention is dropping off somewhat. You can see people gazing wistfully at each other, people gossiping. If you look at the back far corner there, it looks like a fight's about to break out. And the chap on the second row from the back at our end uh, looks like he's lost the will to live. And I'm sure we've all experienced lectures like that. Um, the fact that this is depicting a scene from hundreds or thousand odd years ago um, is telling us that we haven't really moved very far, perhaps, uh, in terms of the lecture. Um, one of the places where this was brought home to me was at the Association for Learning Technology Conference back in 2010. So I attended a talk by this guy, Don Clark, which was ironically called Don't Lecture Me. And he was telling us about why lecturing was, was not the best way to do our teaching and that, in fact, we should get rid of lectures completely. And he was quite forceful in what he said. If you look at uh, Don on Twitter, he, he, he doesn't hold back. He, he, he's very happy to say what he thinks. And that's a good thing but he did upset some of the audience. And I have to say, this was the first time I've been to a conference where everybody sort of had a laptop in front of them. They're all typing away. And I thought, it's a bit rude, isn't it? And, and then I kind of figured what was going on. I wasn't on Twitter myself at the time, but there was a, a Twitter feed on the screen. And as he was telling all these academics that they shouldn't be lecturing and telling them why it was a really ineffective way to teach, they were all tweeting back and were quite vicious in some of the things they were saying, which of course he didn't see at the time because he was delivering his lecture. Uh, but after the event, he, he referred to the idea of being twackled. He, he, he was being heckled throughout this lecture on Twitter. Um, anyway, a lot of the ideas that I've been talking about for the last few years were things that I picked up from this talk. I went back to watch it. It's on YouTube. Uh, if you've got a spare hour or so, it's quite entertaining. And I think what's quite striking watching it now, nine years on, is that a lot of what he said at the time has, has come to pass. And the reality is we probably haven't moved on very much even from that point. So definitely worth a look. Um, the other significance of the picture on the right there is if you remember the classic 80s movie Fer Ferris Bueller's Day Off, uh, that's a, a shot of the economics teacher who was basically talking double Dutch at the front of the room and all the students were falling asleep and uh, dribbling on the table and that kind of thing. Um, again, just showing the ineffectiveness of that, that sort of didactic delivery from the front of the room. 
So if I want to sort of just come up with a list, and we could probably come up with a list twice as long as this, uh, this is just referring to some of those problems with our traditional lectures. Um, coming from a school teaching background, you would never talk to students for more than 10 or 15 minutes at a time. And you'd, you'd really need to be doing something interactive as you were doing that. O Ofsted would give you a really bad rating if you actually spoke to students for 15 minutes and expected them to listen to you. Um, often they're crammed full of material. PowerPoint hasn't helped that. People might come in with up to 100 PowerPoint slides sometimes and whiz through stuff. It, it's, it's not effective. Students arriving at university often have poor note-taking skills. Uh, again, we've sort of already said about this teacher-led approach. We've got a poor staff-student ratio. Um, it's passive for the students quite often. Um, obviously, we've got the issue with times. If it's a nine o'clock lecture on a Monday or a five o'clock lecture on a Friday, your attendance is predictably uh, going to be low. Um, we've said about the focus, staff-student ratio, etc. Um, but for me, from the school teaching environment, um, I'd always wanted to have group learning and active learning, discussion and that kind of thing going on in my lessons. Uh, and that's something which isn't always to do in a lecture. Um, what is particularly lacking, I feel, is, is the dialogue. So as a school teacher, you're continually talking to your students, you're responding to their needs, you're adapting what you're doing as a result of that interaction you're having with them. Um, and it's very difficult to do that in a lecture. Other things that people talk about around the lecture are attendance, and I think there have always been attendance issues. There were when I was a student 25 years ago. Um, so that's something else we need to deal with. But increasingly now, this, this behaviour, I mean, what I'm talking there really is, is about, um, uh, I guess, low-level chats, that kind of thing, which I don't have a problem dealing with as a former school teacher. Uh, but I think some of my colleagues don't like dealing with it. Um, but I do wonder if, if, if they're not attending or if, if they're there but they're not focusing, is it because of all these points that we've said about the ineffectiveness of lectures? If we address those, perhaps we won't have those problems. Anyway, so some solutions. So before I talk about anything to do with voting, actually, I'm, I'm going to just talk about um, something to do with handouts and something I observed when I first went to the uni. Now, I've already mentioned about note taking. If I think back to some of my lectures, uh, I might have been copying down 20 sides of A4 notes, just struggling to keep up. It wasn't going through the brain. There was certainly no learning happening. Um, the note taking itself doesn't foster the learning. You have to go away afterwards and then do learning around that. Is that a good use of face to face time? Uh, then you've got the opposite end of the, 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 the sort of the other extreme, if you like. When I first came to Southampton, quite a lot of my colleagues had really comprehensive handouts and they were fantastic. I mean, everything you needed to know really was on there. And then in the lecture, they would add to that. But because the student had this handout in front of them, they tended to sit there and, and just listen. And I'm not, again, I'm not sure there was much activity going on. It probably works for some, but not for all. Um, and I think it, it does lead to a bit of passivity on the part of the student. So what I tend to do in my lectures, actually, is, is to use these sort of gapped or skeleton handouts. Um, that, that started, actually, when I began teaching on the Science Foundation here in 2012. I had this, this idea I was going to write like loads of notes on my tablet PC. And by the end of the first lecture, I'd only got to slide three. And I realized that isn't going to work for me. So I started putting um, text on there, but leaving gaps. That was originally going to be an interim measure till I came up with another solution. Um, but actually, it ended up working really well with the students. It looks a bit primary school, but it's not because every gap is a question. So I was finding that yeah, I was able to ask, what, what do you think goes in that gap? Or talk to someone else about what you think this sentence should be. And they discuss it. And we're having some activity going on there. As, as a part of that note-taking process, rather than spending time writing stuff down, which is not productive in terms of learning. And we've got all these diagrams and equations. It works really well for chemistry. So I can say to the students, have a go at writing that equation. Don't look at the screen, because I'll be writing the answer on there, but you have a go at your one, and then look at the screen and compare, so they can actually do a bit of assessment there. And I think that's really important, actually, because that's where we start thinking about what was in Phil Racy's model. So let me just bring that up. And I'm not going to discuss the things in the middle. You can go and read Phil's book to find out more about those. But actually, the idea of students doing things, making sense of things, 
feedback, being a process where they're giving each other feedback and having conversations and then the verbalizing element and then the assessing where they're checking what they're doing and comparing it with something else. All of that can be achieved by using these gap handouts in the right way. Um, so I find that really supports my teaching. So that, that's one thing I've done to try to enhance learning in my lectures. Um, and another thing, we talked about the attendance issue. We've got to be realistic in this day and age that the students do have lives. Sometimes things happen and they miss a lecture. By having these gapped handouts and recording the lecture, the student is still able to have that same experience when they watch the recording. Um, you know, they, they could just wait to see what I write and copy it down, or they could actually go through the same thought process. Um, and students tell me, a lot of students, I've had students even say to me now, I'm not going to come to your lectures because actually I can study like this well on my own at home. Now, I don't actually agree with that, but uh, some students have to learn for themselves. Now, so what I'll just talk about here briefly is uh, this, this is a very old video you can see there on the screen. Um, so when I first went to Southampton in 2007, there was some cash kicking around for some voting pads. And at that time, uh, we went for this system, Turning Point, which I think was quite a popular system. And uh, it worked really well for us. Um, so here you can see this is me working with one of my colleagues. Um, I'm helping out there, I'm looking a little bit younger there. Uh, that's my old head of department, Phil. Um, so the fact that I was in this role when I first came to the university where I could support academics um, meant that I was in high demand to go in and do this kind of thing. Um, so what we were trying to do was overcome that issue of the lack of dialogue. So we, we could start to have a conversation. We could try to consolidate learning. We can assess what the students know and give them feedback. Um, and the thing with, with Turning Point as it was at the time, it, it was fairly easy to use. Once I'd gone in and helped colleagues use it for the first time, they were happy to go away and do it themselves. Um, and I published a little bit in this area. And, and that was great. Um, and we sort of carried on doing it over a period of years and had no problems. And uh, along the way, students started to have mobile phones and, and people started to make apps, things like Me Too, as it was, came along. And actually, Southampton University started using Me Too two or three years ago. But I'd invested a lot of time in using Turning Point, and uh, it was going to be a, there was a bit of a, a hurdle there in terms of switching. So I hadn't switched until last summer when I left a bag of 80 Turning Point handsets on a train, and they went missing for three months. I did actually get them back in the end, uh, but in the meantime, I had to go and give a talk at a conference in Durham where I wanted to use interactivity. So I bit the bullet and started using Me Too at the time. And it was such a fantastic experience. Everything worked so well um, that I just switched everything over to that this year. And I've, I've, I've been a, a convert. So it's VVOX now, obviously, um, but I don't see myself switching away from it anytime soon. Um, so let me talk to you a bit about this idea of peer instruction. Um, so I'm not, this isn't a polling slide, so don't get your phones ready for this one. Um, Joe's obviously got VVOX ready for your Q&A. Uh, but I'm just illustrating this idea of peer instruction, which originated with a chap called Eric Mazur at Harvard. There's a link to one of his papers on, a, on the next slide or in a couple of slides time. So I'm not claiming credit for this. I'm not even claiming credit for the question. I actually got this from a guy called Ross Galloway, who's a physicist up at Edinburgh. Um, and basically, we're giving the students a question here where th this is quite a complex conceptual question. Um, because they've got to understand certain processes which are not necessarily given away in the question, um, and they've got to come up with the right answer from the list on, on the left. Now, because you're not all chemists and biologists, I'm not going to bore you with the details of the science here. Uh, but I would get the students to answer this question without having any discussion. It's like, what do you think the answer is? We poll that, and what I normally do at that point is I don't show them the responses. I move on to the next slide. Uh, which is ready to poll again. And at that point, I'll say to the students, OK, speak to the people around you, find somebody who gave a different answer to you, and then discuss that question with them. And why did you give that answer? Why did they give a different answer? What were the concepts? What do you think is the right one? Uh, do you think you're missing something? Do you need to talk to someone else? You, know, you can give them a minute or two to have a conversation there and see how it's going. And you can always judge from the volume level how well that's going. And then you'll encourage them to poll their answer again. They don't have to have changed their mind. Um, but you give them that opportunity. Um, and in, in an ideal world, this is what you want to see happening. So Joe mentioned that I'd given a talk at UWE earlier in the year. I, I put this out to their academics. It was a general audience of academics. I didn't know how well it would work. They weren't all scientists. 
Um, the correct answer here is actually air. And if you're wondering why, it's to do with photosynthesis, and that's the end of the science there. But you can see 30% or so had got it right the first time. And then after those conversations and discussions for a couple of minutes, we polled it again, and the answer had increased to nearly 70%. So you can see that the students, if you like, in this case, have moved on. More of them have got the right answer. Obviously, quite a few of them have still got it wrong. So you still need to actually give them some formal feedback yourself and um, explain to them why that's the right answer. Even those that got it right may not have got it right for the right reason. So that's really important too. But what you've done is you, you've got the students talking to each other. You've got them discussing different concepts. You've opened their mind to this new learning. Um, and you've broken up your lecture by doing this somewhere in the middle. So I think that's a really powerful tool. I, I try to, to slot that into as many lectures as I can, but anyone that's used this technique will tell you the hardest thing is writing the questions. Because you'll either write questions where everyone gets it right first time, so there's not really any point, um, or none of them get it right, and then you've got an issue, there's nobody who's got the right answer, or you have questions where whatever you do, you always get the same kind of spread of answers. So you have to find the right kind of question. There are people doing this. So, you know, I'd say it's worth going and looking. If you're interested, um, this paper, which is one of Mazur's paper, uh, it's actually quite old now, but it talks about the experience of using this at Harvard for 10 years and the evidence that they've got that this impacts on learning is fantastic. People are still doing research in this area now. So there's a paper in the current issue of the Journal of Chemical Education where someone has actually looked quite closely at whether or not you should show the students the results uh, as you're polling the first question. So my reason for not doing that is that if students see that quite a few students are giving answer B, they might all start to think, oh, B's right. Um, but actually in this paper, and you can go away and read it yourselves, and I'll send Joe a link to put with the uh, resources to go with this, uh, but they find that this has a really powerful effect. So I'm, I'm not going to say any more because that's not what we're here for today. Uh, but it's telling you that there are people out there researching this stuff and looking at how you can do it more effectively. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff going on out there. It's worth learning from it. And tools like VVox help you to do it in the classroom in, a, in an efficient way. So the issue I tend to have is so I'll, I'll demonstrate this to colleagues, whether it's here or in other universities or you know whatever, and they'll say to me, OK, that's all well and good, but how do you find the time to do that? I've, I've got all this content to get through, and I've only got this much time, so how on earth can I fit this in? Um, this is where the flipped learning element um, sorts, starts to come into it. So... Oh, now, I don't know if you can hear that or not, but anyway, that, that's your colleague, Pete, um, who's doing an organic chemistry lecture there. Um, so basically, we started recording lectures back in 2009. And uh, at that time, we used to have to use a camcorder and Camtasia software. And it was a tough gig, I have to say. We used to spend hours and hours doing this. Obviously, the time's changed now. We have we use Panopto, which is a system where you can record a lecture and upload it to Blackboard immediately. Um, but back then, this was cutting edge stuff. We, we did a bit of research, actually, into how students were using um, these resources. So actually, I don't know how well you can see this graph on the left. Um, so what happened in this particular year, we had some students who had a, a clash in their timetable, and we wanted to use the lecture recordings to compensate for that so they could um, you know, catch up on what they'd missed. And when we analysed how other students were using these resources, we made them available over Christmas. So if you look at the graph in the middle, you can see that the graph sort of goes up. Um, that's sort of from 8 a.m. in the morning till about 11 at night. That's where the majority of the hits are. But if you look between midnight and 4 a.m. at the start there, that, that represents you know, hundreds, if not a thousand or so views occurring between the hours of midnight and four o'clock. So I think that was the first time we got this sense that students want to learn 24-7. We're never going to teach 24-7, but with these kinds of resources, we can start to deliver on that. Um, this one here, so it was the Christmas holiday when the students were viewing these because we made them available to the whole cohort for the revision period. It looks a bit weird, doesn't it, that students don't view things on Tuesdays, but they like to watch them on Thursdays. But the reason that happened was because it was a year where Christmas and New Year were Tuesdays, um, so students weren't watching them on those days, thankfully. Uh, but they'd recovered from their New Year hangover to be able to then uh, watch them on Thursday, which I guess is why there was a blip there. Anyway.
economy. So the stats can be really informative, and I'll show you some fantastic ones in a minute, um, but, but you also have to take them with a pinch of salt. There's often a story behind them. So in terms of thinking about recorded lectures and whether or not they foster independent learning, I mean, I've, I've, this is a, a statement that came from a module evaluation form that I did. Um, um, it, it says online lecture recordings are the most helpful thing I've experienced in education. Now, whether that's true or not, I very much doubt it, actually. But if students are using it really effectively, you've got a couple of students here who are working together. They're pausing the video. They're discussing points. They're looking things up in the textbook and adding things to their notes. This could be really powerful. Um, but if I look at my stats during the revision period, I will see a block of students who watch eight lectures in eight hours. Uh, they're box setting, if you like. Um, you know, it might work for Breaking Bad. Uh, you watch a box set of DVDs there and, and, and knock yourself out, but it isn't going to work for physical chemistry, that's for sure. Um, so I've got a, this got me thinking about how students were using recordings and whether uh, that was effective or not. Um, and particularly when I was teaching on my science foundation year, where in the first year of teaching, I, I was quite shocked at the pace I had to go at. Um, I taught A-level chemistry for several years. Like we used to have five hours of teaching a week and we could fit everything in no problem. Suddenly I had to fit two years of teaching into about 66 lectures and that proved to be a, a huge challenge. Um, so I had this idea when I, when I first started the course that I was going to use voting technology all the time. We we're going to do peer instruction. We'd have all sorts of interactivity. Uh, the reality was that for me to fit all that content in, I was lecturing for 50 minutes. And when I looked at the module evaluations at the end of the year, this was a comment, um, which uh, you can see what it says. Uh, death by PowerPoint is not what I'd, what I'd expect to have achieved by the end of the year. And, and I, I extracted this from that module evaluation yesterday. I went back and reviewed it. I must say the first part of the sentence was quite positive. Um, but obviously, that wasn't what someone like me would expect. I, I was here as an innovator, someone that, that was trying to drive back uh, the frontiers. And that's not a very uh, good endorsement of my teaching. So that was when I moved to the flipped learning approach, because I wanted to make time for that, that active learning in the classroom. We, we hadn't achieved it in that year. So what I did was I started taking uh, maybe a 15-minute chunk of my lecture and putting that online as a sort of pre-lecture video. That's a, a partially flipped lecture, if you like. Um, and that would then free up time for interactivity. That's how I make room for the peer instruction and for, for the use of the voting technology, along with the other active learning techniques that I tried to include. Um, now, you don't have to do it at the start. I'll show you an example of one in a minute where I did ask some questions at the beginning, um, but you can actually space that interactivity out through the whole session. And that's probably the best way to do it. And that is what I normally do, as well as having that chunk at the start. Obviously, that frees up my time for voting and especially for peer instruction. Um, and then we can have some discussions and student-led question and answer and, and even the odd demonstration where we might blow something up because that's what you have to do in chemistry, right? Um, anyway, so let me just show you how this works. So you've already seen my gapped handout um, sort of structure. So again, I, I will give the students a gapped handout for the partially flipped lecture. So the way I tend to do this is I've got lectures on Monday and Tuesday and on Friday. At the end of Tuesday's lecture, I'll give them a, a small handout, four, four slides, something like this. They'll take that home, and then the video will be online for the next couple of days so they can do that before the next lecture. Same structure, lots of gaps, lots of things they can do. Where, where there's an equation, I'll say to them, why don't you pause the video, have a go at doing it, and then, uh, then you can check your answer against mine, that kind of thing, trying to make it active. Um, and the other thing I, I think is really important here is that, that I cover the less demanding material. Um, with the trickier concepts, I want to, be able to see the whites of the eyes of the students. I can see when their eyes are glazing over, and I can then actually pitch it to them in a slightly different way. Uh, you can't do that when you're delivering a video. So I try and stick to these basic concepts where I think they're going to be able to get some learning um, before they come in uh, to my lecture. So as I say, I will have a little bit of a brief recap um, at the start of the next lecture. I mean, the worst thing you can do with flipped learning is to actually just rehash everything you did in the flips part, because that really annoys students. Um, and I do ask them to bring their completed handout with them. And quite often, I'll ask them to hold it up. Um, and then I can look around the classroom and see who isn't holding up a flipped handout. I know then who hasn't done it. Obviously, I do that in a quite gentle and sensitive way. Uh, but students don't like uh, being shown up. So, so that does tend to work. Students do tend to do this work. 
Um, but you know, we can talk about that another time. Uh, I tend to do that really with about 40% of my lectures. Don't do it every time. Um, it doesn't go down well when I've got the Monday and Tuesday back-to-back -back lectures. If, if I give them something to do on the Monday night before the Tuesday lecture, I do it a few times in the year. Uh, I don't think I'd get away with doing it every week. Here's some stats from Panopto. This is really useful stuff. It shows us that students do watch these things. I particularly like the one at the bottom. Uh, you can see there that, that there's fairly consistent views all the way through the video, apart from the bit in the middle, uh, where they're obviously going back and watching that bit again, because I was trying to teach them physics and obviously making a mess of it. And they were thinking, what the hell is he on about? Um, so that's them going back and watching that bit again. Um, and actually, just wanted to throw this in there. I've already mentioned Eric Mazur, who is one of my heroes, I have to say, um, for his work on peer instruction, but also he was a proponent of flipped learning, if you go back a few years. Um, he has recently said, actually, he, he has moved away from that uh, traditional model of flipped teaching. If you use videos, the students, you're moving the sleeping bit out of your lecture theatre into their study room. You know. Um, now, actually, I think we've got evidence here that, that that's not the case, because if the students were falling asleep watching my flip videos, they wouldn't know that they needed to go back and watch that part again, right? So I think we can see that the attention here is consistent, and I think it's because of the handout. So if you're going to try this, give the students something to do while they're watching the video, because that will maintain their attention. If they just sit back passively, obviously their attention is going to wane, and they're not going to learn a lot. So I think that's a really important tip. Uh, in terms of using the time, just to show you, so again, uh, these are old turning point slides which have all been converted into VVox now. Uh, but what I like here is it's just illustrating, see all those green bars? They're the right answers. So this is from a flip lecture. The students have clearly learned something because they wouldn't be getting these questions right. Where you see the red bars, that's really helpful guidance to me. I can see where the misconceptions are and I can give them feedback to help them overcome those. Um, so actually, the student response stuff. Um, now, I'm, I'm looking at the time here, and I'm thinking, well, we probably should be starting to wind this up. So I'm, I'm going to go through this quite quickly. But there's a link to another video on there, which I'll share with Joe, so he, you can get the URL straight from uh, from his uh, web page. Um, and I'll just, just show you some of the data that we collected here, um, really just to show how positive it is. So, so the overwhelming message on this particular slide is you can see I'm asking them about their confidence in a range of different contexts. The numbers where it's essay, that means strongly agree. We've got strongly disagree on the right. You can see that the students are largely in agreement that their confidence has increased. You know, you can argue that that's a, a leading question. But when you look at the numbers, the numbers actually vary between the different categories. So I think this is you know, real data. It does actually have some meaning. And particularly look at the middle one where, where 10 of them are strongly agreeing. It says that, that their confidence when answering questions verbally in class has improved. So that's great. I think that's because of the peer instruction is actually helping my students to engage. Uh, in terms of the qualitative data, so there's some interesting stuff here. It's expanded on a lot more in an article uh, there. And I talk about this more in this video that, that you've got that link to that there. If you want to hear a bit more about that, I recommend watching the, the, the video there. And I talk a bit about the, this qualitative data and how it relates to the theory on that. And it was all positive. Uh, I think I'll just put this one up for a second. Um, this was from a student who studied on the foundation year with me. Uh, probably it was the second or third year that I was doing this. And you can see that he was so uh, positive about it that he this was an unsolicited comment. He just emailed me at the end of the year and said, um, you know, this is how I felt about it. Um, and it's really nice when you get things like that. It obviously shows that the student has valued what you've done, so he will feel good about that. But he's actually telling me why it's helpful to him. And you think about things like uh, students being able to uh, constructively contribute. And you look at the bottom paragraph there where, where you can see how the information fits into what's been learned previously. This is what students, uh, this is what we should be doing as teachers, rather. We should be getting our students to be able to do this. And these methods do allow us to do that. Um, so I think that's really important. There's just an acknowledgement slide to thank some of the people who I've worked with over the years. Um, but in particular, I'd like to thank you for your attention and for your patience with the slight technical hurdles at the start. Um, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Hopefully, Joe's been monitoring those because I, I can't see any of that on my screen at the moment. Hi, David. Yeah, thank you right. very much. For, um, yeah, thank you very much for that. And um, 
Yeah, that was really, um, yeah, that was really interesting. I, I, I always really like to, uh, I really like to hear about, um, you know, when, when you kind of blend the kind of, you know, the sort of digital engagement using something like, uh, something like a VBOX with the that kind of group discussion and, um, you know, things like that. I think it's, it's something that I always, um, you know, promote with people when they're talking about, you know, incorporating VBOX in. If, if someone asking a question verbally is is going to really add something to the session. You don't don't just uh, don't just sort of strictly stick to VBOX for the sake of it. I think where it you know obviously comes into its own is giving a voice to uh, you know to people who maybe are a bit shy in doing that. So um, yeah. Well, and just well, what one little anecdote to share. So that that first year where I didn't use the technology in that way, my my lectures were, were quiet. The students would not put their hands up and respond to questions. They wouldn't talk to each other. And right. as soon as I started doing this. But then I can't shut them up, you know, and it's they are talking about the chemistry, you know, obviously occasionally they might digress, but you know, it it makes all the difference. And I get students who want to engage. Um, it's not universal, but it works for some of them. Yeah. No, I mean that's um yeah, that's great. And I think it's, you know, a real real kind of testament to um yeah, you know, to, to your to your teaching and uh, um you know and to the, the the technology as well. Um yeah, we have been getting some uh yeah, we have been getting some questions, uh, you know, coming in. We may not get to get through to all of them, but I am gonna, um, yeah, I am gonna sort of ask a um, ask a few. So, one of the questions that came in, um, and you know, we are using. Feel free to ask more questions. You know, the VBOX session is still open, um, and yeah, feel free to sort of pop those questions over. But um, one of the questions here: um, How do you deal with students that don't access the pre-lecture recording? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, yeah, that is a problem. It's a perennial problem with flip learning. I told you about my little trick of getting them to bring the hand out with them. Um, so they kind of have that. Uh, it's, it's not naming and shaming. It's not quite like that. I do, as I say, I do it in a sensitive way. But they don't like feeling like when they look around and see everyone else has done it, they're like, oh, I didn't think anyone else was going to do this. <laughs> and I'm, I'm the odd one out. Um, and of course, they also then find that they can't answer the questions that I'm posing at the start. They can yeah. see that other students can. If we do peer instruction, the other students are able to talk about the concepts and they're not. Um, so, you know, I think that you've got that, you've got the carrot and the stick in a way. Um, uh, the other thing, I am very lucky, I do get these students at the start of their university journey that on the day that this foundation year students, this, I get them for induction, I give them a handout and say before the first lecture on Monday, you need to watch this lecture and fill in this handout. So the likelihood of them not doing it is diminished greatly if it's the first thing you're asking them to do when they arrive at university. Where it's a problem is if you introduce it in year three and they've never done it before, um, yeah. you know, we've seen very poor engagement in that case so you actually do need to explain to the students what you're doing why you're doing it what your expectations are and what they're going to get out of it if they do take part and then if you can't persuade them after all of that well they're going to be unpersuadable anyway um, and at least you can be safe in the knowledge that they can go away and then engage with that material afterwards um you know it's you do everything you can don't let the tail wag the dog and say oh, i'm not doing it because 30 percent of students aren't going to engage that, that's actually their problem if you do all the other stuff right do you see the um do you see the behavior for want of a better word improving throughout the course if, if you're doing that that's an interesting one. So um, I, I think students are changing all the time. So I think this this issue with the, the low level chat and perhaps my some of my colleagues see it as disrespectful behaviour. It does seem to have got worse in, in recent years. And I don't know if this is universal. I think it is from what I hear from other people. Um, it, it, there's a risk in doing this because you're in, you're saying to them you need to talk to each other. And if some of them do go off on a tangent, it's going to be quite hard to bring them back in. And, it, you know, as I say, as a school teacher, you, th this is how you teach. You, you have to get students talking and doing stuff. Uh, for some of my colleagues, they find it very difficult to say, yeah, you talk about that for two minutes because they feel yeah. like they've lost control of the lecture theatre when they do that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it, it can be hit and miss, but you, you have to be someone who's prepared to bang on the table and say, right, guys, that's enough now. We need to move on. Um, and they they do tend to respond if you do that. Cool. Um, just let me look. Um, some other questions here. There's a question here. Uh, uh, how quickly did you did you sort of see students uh, adapting to using tech like uh, like VBOX and lectures? I think I, I think maybe to add to that as well is obviously you've been using um, 
you've been using sort of physical handsets, um, you know, in the past. Did you kind of see the same sort of numbers of people using it in the lecture with a mobile you know, solution? Did you see the numbers drop off? What? Uh, but that's an interesting one because I'd say in, in most of my lectures, so to be fair, on the foundation year, I'd probably have at most 50 students in a lecture. Uh, and the, probably the, the most I've seen this year responding is probably 38. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've not, because it was my first time using it, I've not like, I've not tried to work out who's not using it and, and say, look, you really should do this. I'm planning to do that a bit more next year. I really think everyone should be doing it. I think some students were fearful that we were tracking them, uh, which yeah. we're not. But what I'd say to them is actually don't be fearful of that because if we if we can see where people are getting questions wrong, that actually can help us to then improve the feedback to those individuals. I'd, I'd actually quite like to use it in that way where we do track students. Um, so, yeah, um, uh, I think the engagement one... It, it was always the same when we gave out the handsets. There'd always be 10 or so that, that just wouldn't respond. So I don't think it's changed it very much. And I think that, um, I think it kind of ties in with what you were saying before about, you know, introducing the technology well at the beginning and, and explaining what the value is to the student to use it. Um, actually, I, I think that idea of tracking kind of comes into that as well. I think if you explain to, um, you know, I think if you explain to students, we're not tracking, um, you know, for this reason, or if you were, you know, for something like Vbox, you can run it in an identified way. If you were to do that, I think you would have to explain to students why you're why you're doing that and what the value is um, to them. For, you know, for, mm -hmm. for doing it that way. Uh, oh, so the only thing I'd sort of say is that there is the issue that if they've got their phones out and then they get distracted by something else. I do occasionally see that where we've we've done it and then there are kids still looking at their phone afterwards. But again, because I've only got a small group, I, I will kind of like try and catch their eye and wave at them while I'm doing my lecturing without disrupting the flow too much. Yeah. Um, you, 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 it'd be difficult in a big class. I understand all these things come with challenges. Uh, there's a question here. Do you use VVOX results post lectures? So it depends what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, I what, what I tend to do actually is uh, I always save my lecture slides um, after I've delivered the lecture, and that that keeps a record then. And the following year, when I'm preparing to do the lecture again, I will look at what the responses were from the previous year. And it's really interesting that that sometimes you'll teach something in a slightly different way, and and the results will go. They might go up. They might go down. You know, I mean, you do see both kinds of things happening. But that that's probably the way I do routinely do that. I always, as I'm doing my lecture, I've got the slides from last year in front of me, where I've added the notes, and I see the the polling slides there. And and sometimes I'll even say to the students, "Oh yeah, you've done a lot better than last year's students did." Um, I probably don't tell them when they've done worse because that wouldn't that wouldn't be good. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of like other stuff, we have used it. I mean, we use it in a bunch of other ways, which I don't didn't have time to talk about. But we did use it in some of our workshop sessions this year, which are sort of groups of twenty, and uh, we were asking students uh, questions. That, and, and then some stuff for them about reflecting on their performance. How did they feel they were performing? Those kinds of questions. And that's actually quite useful because if you get the sense that the whole group is feeling quite negative, we can then use that to try and boost their confidence going forward. So we did tend to look at those afterwards and think, okay, if then if they're not happy about that, we need to try and change something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there are so many other ways you could use it. Um, we, we're just scratching the surface, really. It, this is quite an interesting question, actually. If, if my uh, my memory of the kind of traditional lecture theatre um, is still true, do you have any uh, do you have any special seating sort of to accommodate peer discussion in the in the lecture? That, that's a great question, and unfortunately, I mean that's one of the problems we've got, right? So in the in the long version of my talk, I, I do talk about the the infrastructure of the university and how the lecture is not going to go away anytime soon because we've got hundreds of lecture theatres all over the place. So unfortunately not. Um, we do have some rooms where, where we have flexible seating and you can group people around a table and that's much easier to have a conversation. But, you know, the, the, you can sort of turn around and, and sort of turn to the person behind you here. You can turn around that way. You've got the person in front here. You know, there's probably about eight or nine different people around you who you could yeah. interact with without too much trouble. Um, so again, we've got to make the best of the situation we're in. The students actually seem to be quite forgiving about it. I've not, I've not had students start complaining, saying ah. this, this isn't a suitable room. You know, I mean, that that may come at some point. 
and like I said, you know, if you're if it's if it's very much a, a five minute, ten minute kind of part, actually, it's probably it's possibly not too bad. If it was a you know bigger part of the lecture where actually having that group discussion was like twenty minutes, half an hour, then you may be a, a stronger consideration. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, in a way it would be better if people would move around because what I tend to find is my students, because we're in the same lecture theatre quite a lot, they sit in the same seats all through the year. So they end up talking to the same people. And actually, yeah. if you're doing peer instruction, you do want to mix it up a little bit. Cool. Um, I'm obviously just sort of conscious of the um, of the time. So it's, uh, yeah, it's sort of 10 to 3. And um, yeah, we obviously sort of want to get sort of things wrapped up. There are there are a few more questions, so perhaps um, yeah, perhaps I'll kind of ping them over to you kind of after the webinar. We can put some answers together and um, yeah, kind of get it sent out to people. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, really thank you for that. That was um, yeah, really interesting to hear. And I hope everyone um, yeah, I hope everyone really enjoyed it. Um, one of the things I just wanted to uh, let people know about is um, we've got a we've got a product update coming at the end of um, on the well on the nineteenth of June um, it's scheduled for um, but we've, before that we've got the uh, the what's new what's next webinar um, if you go to our if you go to our website um, you'll be able to find on there a um, yeah a link to um, a link to go to it actually what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, I probably should have prepared for this, but I'm going. I'll send a link out to it in the uh, in the Q and A board if you want to go in and register for that. There's some really uh, some really interesting um, yeah new features coming in that. There's uh, some new there's a new polling type um, coming in. There's um, uh, some sort of information about our sort of LTI integration that we've um, that we've created for um, for Canvas. Um, our kind of support for sort of single sign-on as well as in there, um, and some improvements to the sort of the dashboard interface um, is on there as well. So I'm just going to post a link out to that on the Q and A board. If anyone wants to uh, register, you can just follow um, you can just follow that link. Um, yeah, I, I guess all that um, yeah, all that, all that sort of remains to be said is you know thank you for um, yeah thank you for joining. It was um, yeah really really interesting. All of the recording the recording of this will be sent out um, to to everyone afterwards, and you can also find all of the um, recordings of all of our um, all of our previous webinars. Perhaps if we're following uh, David's advice, let's not go in there and binge watch all of them. But uh, <laughs> yeah, they're <laughs> they're all there, and you can um, yeah you can watch them at your um, at, at your leisure. Um, thank you very much, and um, yeah, I look forward to sort of seeing you all um, soon on our next um, on our next webinar.